-hmm. We went to visit um, Gavin in hospital the other day. He's been very, very ill with a life-threatening infection. Um, but during the course of the conversation to him, it was said to him, you have to go to the nether world. And he looked at me and scrunched up his brow and he said, but I've already been there. And it was said to him, but you were different then. So it seems that we've been delving a little bit into the arcane over these last days. And it's wondered whether you dared to, to go where it leads. A monk was walking down the road in the evening time when coming in the other direction was a little boy carrying a lantern to light his way. But when they met, the monk blew out the flame and said to the young boy, Tell me, where has the light gone? And the young boy said, you tell me where the light has come from, and I'll tell you where it has gone. In the years sitting beside Divine Mother, when she, as she was, transmitted the light, sitting beside her with an inner eye, it was seen that as she transmitted the light, it was like smoke coming out of people's heads, and I would watch it gather in the ceiling of the room, and sometimes it became just like sticky tar. And I used to ask myself, what does she do with it? Where does it go? And over these last days, the question has been asked of us, when the Buddha came to sit under the Bodhi tree and he said, I'm not moving from here until I know. And then the dancing girls came along to tempt him. And the flames and fires tried to consume him. And the demons danced in front of him. What did he do? And we know we can only answer these questions from our own experience. So there's a reminder of a story. It's a story of a day when the Baal Shem Tov, that great man who started Hasidic Judaism, walked out of his door after being in the synagogue after prayer and he looked up into the sky and he saw a, a black cloud in the distance. And he called three of his followers, his Asidim, to him. And he said, we have a task to do. And he called for his wagon and his horse. And without questioning, the Baal Shem Tov's authority. The three hussied him, followed him into the wagon, and it seemed that in a trice they were in a far distant place and stopped in front of a rural inn. So the Baal Shem Tov, followed by the Hasidim, descended from the wagon and went over and knocked on the door of the inn, and they were invited inside by the innkeeper. And the Baal Shem Tov said, uh, we are travelers on the road, can you offer us a place for the night? And uh, the innkeeper rather suddenly said, no rooms available. Oh, said the Baal Shem Tov, you mean that your rooms are full? No, they're empty, is said the innkeeper. But the Baal Shem Tov noticed that the innkeeper, be behind his gruff manner, there was great sadness. And he asked him, what is it that is troubling you? 
and tears began to roll down the innkeeper's face. And he said, Tomorrow is my son's circumcision ceremony. But I have had seven sons before this one, and on the eve of their brie, each one has died. I am afraid that I am going to lose this eighth son. Oh, said the Baal Shem to, perhaps we can help with this. And the innkeeper, of course, recognized the deep depth of what it was that the Baal Shem Tov was and represented, and said, yes, there are rooms available. You may stay. Now, the Baal Shem Tov gathered his Hasidim to him, and he said, tonight you must keep a vigil beside the crib of this child. And he turned to the innkeeper and he said to him, bring me a sack. And when the sack was brought, he gave it to his Hasidim and said, if anything happens through the night, close the sack and call me. So the Hasidim knew that this was a very great and important task for them and they should not, for one wink, sleep. That they must keep alert and awake. So standing beside the crib, they kept each other awake by reciting the prayers now the fire was going in the house. The candles were burning around the crib. But at about midnight, suddenly, the flames of the candles began to waver. And one by one, they went out. There was only then the light of the fire to bring light to the room. But then it seemed the wind grew stronger and even the flames of the fire were put out. Darkness descended. The three Hasidim were very afraid. They felt a presence. When suddenly the window flew open and a creature flew in and was about to land on the crib when the three Hasidim held up the sack and something flew into it, hissing and screeching. Quickly they tied the sack up and as they were instructed to do, they immediately called the Baal Shem Tov to come. He came, bringing his staff, and when he arrived, he beat the sack with his staff. His Hasidim had never seen such power and seeming anger in their great rabbi. Out of the sack there was much hissing and screaming and wailing. But then he instructed his Hasidim to take the sack outside the door of the inn and release the creature. And when they did, they saw a great black cat limping off into the distance. The next day, the child was alive and to the great joy and delight of the innkeeper, the circumcision could take place, and celebrations followed. But the innkeeper said it's very strange, because usually the squire 
of our county comes to every circumcision on every occasion and has had to be turned away because my son had died. But today he did not come. Oh, said the Baal Chim Tom, let me go and visit him with one of these fine bottles of wine that you have been serving in this celebration. So the Baal Shem Tov, taking his bottle of wine, went off to the house of the squire. And when he was taken in by the servants into the chamber where the squire lay, bandaged, bruised, battered, and with hate and venom in his eyes, he faced the Baal Shem Tov and said, I know it was you. You have great magic, but you caught me unawares. I challenge you to a duel of magic. The Baal Shem Tov replied, I have no magic but I will join you in this duel. So a date and time was made for this to take place. And of course it got out to all and sundry and there was a great gathering come around to see this duel of magic. These two beings, the magician and the Baal Shem Tov, but when they faced off to one another, the squire magician looking very confident of his panoply of magic tricks, the Baal Shem Tov standing very calmly with his staff in his hand. And as the magician wizard prepared himself, so to speak. The Baal Shem Tov drew with his staff seven circles around him and stood in the center. Now the magician, conjuring up with his spell, behind him formed a great fiery furnace, and out of those flames he conjured a great fierce lion. The lion immediately went to break the first circle around the Baal Shem Tov, but as it entered the first circle, it went up in smoke and descended into ashes. The magician wizard was quite surprised, so he called out another great beast who traversed the sixth and the fifth rings, but also went up in their own flames to become ash at the feet of the Baal Shem Tov. The wizard was more and more surprised. So he called out even greater beasts, the ghouls, the demons, and they broke the sixth ring around the Baal Shem Tov. But again, they went up in their own flames to become ash. Now the wizard was depleted. He had no recourse but to call on all the demons of the nether worlds, those that come from the bowels of what is said to be hell. But just as they approached the Baal Shem Tov's final 
ring and broke through. The Baal Shem Tov raised his staff and immediately all the demons of hell were consumed in their own fire and became dust at the Baal Shem Tov's feet. The wizard was played out. He had no further spells with which to conjure any further demons, <coughs> ghouls of any kind. And he, like those that he had brought forth, was consumed in the flames of his own furnace and became the dust at the feet of the Baal Shem Tov. What has this story and its preceding anecdotes have to do with the question, the questions. If you tell me where the flame, the light has come from, I'll tell you where it is gone. Where did the smoke, the tar that gathered go? What did Divine Mother do. And this question, when the demons came, the fire came, the dancing girls came, what did the Buddha do? We can only answer this from our own experience. Perhaps you've already related it to us, Jaya, from your experience. Translated. Right. Mm. What is the answer? What do we do without doing? We have no magic, mm. nor do we have a staff that we can raise. What do we do? What is it that occurs in the transmutation? I think we just observe it. It's, it's when we um, you know, it's like with the circles and the, and the demons, it's it's, you know, they enter the circle. They enter the circle. Indeed. And, and we embrace them. Mm -hmm. And it's not comfortable. It's not comfortable at all. Um, because they have the potential to devour us. Yes. Mm. Indeed. But by, by um, being present with them. Um, they have the potential to transmute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.